Well, there are almost 600,000 stockbrokers in this country, and by most accounts, the vast majority of them are honest and ethical. A minority, though, is not. Our Garrett Glazer is here now with the first in a series of reports called Bad Brokers. Garrett. Thanks, Maria. Tyler. Over a three-month period, CNBC looked at what happens to investors victimized by the unscrupulous and sometimes criminal acts of licensed stockbrokers. In some cases, we found the deck stacked against individual investors. In cases of microcap fraud in particular, the regulatory system can fail and does. Or in other cases, when help finally does arrive, it may be too late. I mean, a good talker? Really, um, a wonderful talker, really smooth, became my best friend, always asked me about the kids, how the divorce was going, how the move was going to be going, how I was doing. Kara Marks, single mother of three, an illustrator, self-employed, lost $50,000 through her licensed stockbroker. Eighteen months after opening the account, Kara Marks came to realize that the broker was trading her account in risky stocks without her authorization, a lot. Kara Marks complained, got a lawyer. He is Philip Adakoff, a specialist in the area of investors' rights. Adakoff sees big problems by some second-tier brokerage firms. We're talking about a systemic fraud. We're talking about, in my opinion, criminal or quasi-criminal activity that is fleecing American customers for untold millions of dollars every year. Kara Marks was legally unable to sue her broker required instead to go through arbitration overseen by the securities industry, the National Association of Securities Dealers. She is not alone. Virtually every brokerage customer in this country has given up the right to sue. You see, it's standard language when you sign that brokerage agreement at the time you open your account. Despite more than two years of delays by attorneys for broker Michael Katz and his firm at the time, now known as First Asset Management, Kara Marks won. The arbitrators awarded her the 50000 she lost and 82000 more. She put trust in a broker who, quite frankly, abused that trust. Five years after she opened the account, Michael Katz is still around, still selling stocks. We trace him to a firm with its own disciplinary history, Gaines Berland. When I called him for his side of the story, broker Michael Katz said he couldn't talk on the phone, so we paid a visit to his office. I'm looking for Mike Katz. He's not available at the moment. What happened to his license? As far as I am aware, there has been no action taken against him. In the years that I've done this, not one broker involved in any case that I've ever tried, to my knowledge, has ever been referred for discipline as a result of that case. Mrs. Mark still doesn't have her money. Lawyers are challenging the arbitrator's decision, calling it irrational. One firm principal told me, we'll fight it. It's unfair. I asked Kara Marks what she thinks about the broker's continued employment in the industry. I think that's disgusting. I think it's egregious. And I think that if a broker goes through a, a, a setting as that and is, has a, a, an award and decision against them, that they should not be able to work. And okay. if you can uh, get away with five millimeter slices, then we'll do that. Clark Gardner was even less fortunate. The California radiologist had been investing for years, hardly what you'd call unaware. Still, when Dr. Gardner got a series of calls from a broker he'd never met, he agreed to open an account. Forgive me, Dr. Gardner. You are a sophisticated, educated professional. Why did you give your money to somebody you'd never met? I shouldn't have. I wish I hadn't. And uh, with any other type of investment, I've always met the individual. But this gentleman was so... Um, uh, slick and so uh, uh, cunning and so uh, uh, much of a charismatic individual on the phone that I, I felt comfortable dealing with him. The broker, Sam Weber, worked for the now defunct firm regulators say was among the worst, Stratton Oakmont. Weber's first trade for Dr. Gardner was a small amount of stock in Dr. Pepper. It went up slightly. Soon after, Weber pushed a little company Dr. Gardner had never heard of, Select Media. It was a communications company and um, he touted it as being a um, hot industry at the time, that communication was a very uh, uh, heavy industry and that uh, it was uh, a guaranteed uh, mover. It moved all right to the basement. Select Media and later the other stocks Weber sold the doctor fluctuated a while and then mostly tanked. Some have come back, too late for the doctor though, who lost $184,000 over a 13-month period. 
Telephone transcripts show that time and again when Dr. Gardner called Weber and demanded that Weber sell, Weber did not. In one 10-minute call, Dr. Gardner instructed Weber to sell 23 times without success. Dr. Gardner eventually took the firm's four principals to arbitration, and his attorney says after two years of delay tactics by the other side, the doctor won not just the 184000 of which he'd been cheated, but a record in punitive damages for an individual investor, $10 million. Have you got it? Not a dime. How come? Um, it's a good question. On the eve of Dr. Gardner's arbitration, the broker declared bankruptcy. Sam Weber may be bankrupt, but he's got a nice house on Long Island, New York. We paid a visit there to ask for his side in all of this, but the woman who answered the door put an end to that. Sorry. You don't want to do it? If only Dr. Gardner had known about his broker's disciplinary history, known in the industry as a CRD. I'm looking, there's like, I don't know, 50 pages? Correct. This is not just one or two complaints. No, it's not. Most of these CRDs will be five or six pages in length, and this one is 50 some odd pages. And yet he was still in business. Still in business, and he remained in business until just two weeks ago, when the NASD finally suspended him. How is it possible that he still has his license to sell stocks? You'll have to ask the NASD. Well, we did, and we'll show you what the NASD said in depth tomorrow night. Okay, to learn more about investor protection, check out our website, cnbc.wsj.com. No computer, no problem. Send a stamped self-addressed envelope to invest wisely here at CNBC, and we'll send you a free SEC brochure full of helpful advice. And we'll see you back here tomorrow night. And we'll hear from the NASD tomorrow night in your yes, second sir. part of the series. Thank and you. Four-part series? Yes, Gun good. Friday. All right, good enough. Thanks a lot. Gary. Okay. Well, the national numbers for last year aren't out just yet, but in 1996, more than 30,000 investors filed broker complaints with federal, state, local, and industry regulators. Tonight, in his special report, Bad Brokers, Business Center's Garrett Glazer talks with the people who oversee enforcement of the nation's securities law. Garrett? Thanks, Tyler. Maria? The securities industry points with pride to its own research, showing that complaints against brokers are down. Regulators have different statistics, even though, even so, many of those involved in enforcement say that the systems in place are working better than before to protect investors from unscrupulous brokers, firms, and scam artists. The headlines and press releases keep on coming. Authorities crack down, traders and firms hit hard, maybe even arrests. Tough new rules coming. For Kara Marks, it all comes too late. She lost $50,000. Radiologist Clark Gardner lost $184,000 through a notorious firm now shut down, Stratton Oakmont. Like Kara Marks, he won in arbitration, but still waits for his money. Stratton Oakmont is a firm that we know well, uh, all too well. Barry Goldsmith is the top enforcement official at NASDR. That's the regulation subsidiary of the National Association of Securities Dealers, the people who run the NASDAQ stock market and who oversee all brokers and broker dealers. Goldsmith is a respected litigator, came from the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC. The pictures hanging in his office are impressive. Here he is prosecuting Ivan Bosky, and here Michael Milken. We asked him about Dr. Gardner's case. Uh, NASD regulation in December of 1996 expelled Stratton Oakmont uh, from the association. We sued 33 former reps of Stratton Oakmont uh, in addition to the firm's president and head trader who we barred from the business in December of 1996. Goldsmith and his team can point to notable accomplishments since stinging SEC criticism two years ago that NASD was lax in enforcing its own price collusion rules for brokers. As part of the settlement, NASD vowed to spend $100 million over five years to beef up enforcement. These days, NASD regulation reports its budget is up 45 percent over the last three years, spending $222 million this year, staffing up 32 percent. 428 brokers barred for life last year. 5,000 complaints were filed by investors with NASD regulation last year. More than 1,000 new disciplinary actions were taken, the result of those complaints and the agency's own routine enforcement actions. NASD regulators can also point to success against more than half a dozen companies 
involved in what the NASD said was microcap stock fraud. I don't think there's a, a, a regulatory quick fix that will eliminate uh, bad brokers from this industry. What we're doing really is approaching it on three fronts. Included in those fronts are bringing significant enforcement actions, NASD rule changes to combat fraud, control so-called cold calling, win temporary cease and desist authority, increase phone call taping, and a new unit, the Criminal Prosecutions Assistance Group, to help coordinate with criminal prosecutors nationwide. Other reforms underway, the NetWatch project to beef up surveillance of Internet transactions, a much-delayed redesign of the NASD website to speed up broker background information to the public. Changes, too, in the NASD arbitration process. That's where most investors go to file complaints, since virtually all brokerage customers in this country have signed away the right to sue. You see, it's in the fine print when you opened your brokerage account. Something critics say to keep in mind, the National Association of Securities Dealers is an SRO, a self-regulatory organization, the industry policing itself. The NASD is overseen by the Securities and Exchange Commission here in Washington. Each year, on average, the SEC brings 500 civil enforcement actions. It takes the collective effort of the SEC, the NASD, and, and a, lot of other, a lot of other players to really to solve the problem. Richard Walker heads enforcement at the SEC. Most of those I have interviewed uh, acknowledge that things are much better than they have been. Uh, but my question remains, do you see a, a crisis in enforcement? I would not say that there's a crisis in enforcement. Our work is, uh, we, have, we are sort of a full employment agency in good times and in bad. We see things differently during those times. Uh, and I wouldn't want to send out a message that investors shouldn't have confidence in our markets. If I send out any message, it is that investors should be thoughtful and careful with their money. Well, more evidence that regulators are making progress. Right now, 30 major Wall Street firms are reportedly considering payment of tens of millions in SEC fines. That to settle outstanding charges of trading violations on the NASDAQ stock market. Okay, tomorrow, is there a crisis in regulation? We'll hear from victims' advocates who argue that despite all the effort, the outlook for investor safety today is as bad as ever or worse. And if you'd like to know more about protecting yourself as an investor, check out our website, cnbc.wsj.com, and then just click on the Bad Brokers icon. If you don't have Internet access, no problem. I'll gladly send you a free copy of an SEC pamphlet called Invest Wisely. Just send me a self-addressed stamped envelope. The address is Invest Wisely, care of CNBC Business News, 2200 Fletcher Avenue, Fort Lee, New Jersey, 07024. And we'll see you back here tomorrow with part three. Absolutely. We look forward to three and four Thanks. on Friday. Thank you very much, Garrett Glazer. Later this year, the National Association of Securities Dealers, after much delay, will make available on the Internet disciplinary histories of brokers and brokerages. Until now, investors have had to wait weeks for that information to arrive in the mail. Now, however, a possible glitch. Garrett Glazer is here with that story and more in his special report on bad brokers. Garrett. Thanks, Maria. A spokeswoman for the NASD confirms a number of brokers have written the association and asked that upcoming Internet disclosures exclude brokers' prior criminal convictions if unrelated to investments, fraud, or theft. The NASD says it will seek public comment and then decide. The SEC would have the final say. Okay, Bad Brokers Part 3. Last night, regulators made their case. Tonight, we hear from victims' advocates. just isn't doing its job. They may find some of the individual principles, the states may find them, they slap their hands, but they continue to do business. Attorney Diane Nygaard has been representing investors for more than two decades. Today she's president of PIABA, that's the Trade Association of Investors' Rights Attorneys. I cannot tell you how much I, I wish that the regulators uh, were not the foxes guarding the chicken coop. One of the biggest areas of contention, the very idea of self-regulation. Virtually every brokerage customer in this country signs away the right to sue, no matter how egregious the violation. Even if your broker steals from you outright, you cannot sue in court. You must abide by the decision of arbitrators selected by the securities industry. It's been that way for the last decade. That troubles New York State Attorney General Dennis Vacco. The waiver of your rights uh, is certainly something that is uh, deeply disturbing to me. 
and I think that it has in some fashion uh, shielded the bad actor uh, for a period of time, for some time. Uh, and I think that this is something that we need to take a serious look at. Critics have long suggested that problems be arbitrated far away from the industry itself. Some suggest an impartial group like the American Arbitration Association. The NASD, which of course is paid for by fees assessed to brokerage firms uh, and therefore has little independence, it's the securities business. And until we get uh, a non-biased watchdog uh, regulatory agency or until the SEC steps in and changes the way that the NASD functions or replaces it, we will have a problem. Regulators deny that and research shows brokerage customers won more than 58 percent of the time. Other areas of contention are the punishments severe enough. Joe Borg directs the Alabama Securities Commission and is considered a national leader in microcap stock fraud reform. We need more criminal action. You know, it's, it's a shame, but let's face it, if, I'm, if all I do is find somebody and they steal $5 million and I take three away, that still leaves them $2 million. It's a cost of doing business. Borg wonders why big-name brokerages are permitted to continue clearing stock trades for bad firms, in effect lending big-name credibility to the bad guys. Critics ask why regulators aren't pre-screening initial public offerings of stock for truthfulness, in effect stopping a problem before it begins. As to insufficient punishment of criminal brokers, it's true that the NASD has no power to prosecute criminally. All it can do is fine and censure. It can and does refer the worst offenders to federal, state, and local prosecutors. Everyone we spoke to agrees those agencies are overwhelmed. We have a staff of about 70, including investigators, attorneys, and accountants, but we have jurisdiction over, over uh, the state of California, which, if it were a country, would have the seventh largest gross national product in the world. Bill McDonald heads enforcement for California's securities regulators, and he has another beef. Says the NASD's computer system, which keeps track of brokers, is sorely lacking. The ongoing inability to find out who the bad, per bad people are is a real problem. For example, if you want to know from the NASD how many brokers and what were their names were terminated for cause by their brokerage houses in the last six months, they have no way of giving you that information. NASD says a new system will provide that service when it belatedly debuts next year. Neil Sullivan heads a national organization of state regulators and says NASD performance is better, but with a qualification. The size of the industry and the growth in the industry and the numbers of new, less sophisticated investors are really straining the system, and the system just can't keep pace. Keeping pace, case in point, we asked NASD Regulations Enforcement Chief Barry Goldsmith about the case of a California radiologist defrauded of $184,000 by a broker named Sam Weber. We sued Mr. Weber in October of 1997, and we barred Mr. Weber um, within the last two months. But attorney Philip Adikoff represented the victim, Dr. Clark Gardner, and says his client was victimized mostly after regulators had taken action. Dr. Gardner was defrauded after, primarily after, Stratton Oakmont was under a permanent injunction by the United States District Court in Washington, D.C. not to engage in this activity. They were violating an SEC complaint which resulted in a permanent injunction issued by the District Court in February of 1995 and Clark Gardner lost the majority of his money between February of 1995 and April of 1995. Adikoff says the NASD finally managed to hear Dr. Gardner's case two years later. We undertook our own unscientific survey and asked 16 investors' rights attorneys for their take on all of this. We covered every NASD enforcement district in the country, and here's what we found. 14 of the 16 attorneys said they've noticed no significant improvement in the overall regulatory situation since 1996, when the SEC publicly and harshly criticized the NASD. And all 16 attorneys were dissatisfied with the way the NASD runs its arbitration programs. The vast majority of bad brokers never go to jail. If that's true, why is it so? Well, it's a resource problem. I mean, there are 190,000 agents operating in California. There are a half a million or more operating in the United States. 
n neither the states nor the federal government has the resources to go after more than a very small number of them. This convicted con man backs up that assessment. He told us before he went to jail he swindled investors out of $40 million. We had absolutely no concern uh, that, the, uh, that the law enforcement folks would be able to stop us from doing what we, what, we, what we did. But you know that the NASD has a team of people that didn't bother you at all? No, because they're, they're outnumbered by maybe a thousand to one. So the chances of me hitting uh, Super Lotto are probably better than those folks catching up to me. Well, after three months of asking questions, we found no easy answers. Brokers, regulators, investors, advocates, each has different approaches to strengthening the weak links. Are investors safe today? Depends who you ask. But this much is clear. There is still no substitute for doing your homework because once you've lost your money, everybody agrees it's very tough to get it back. For more on information on how to protect yourself, check out our website, cnbc.wsj.com. You can also drop me a line with a self-addressed stamped envelope. I'll send you a free copy of a useful brochure called Invest Wisely. The address, uh, the address is Invest Wisely, care of CNBC Business News, 2200 Fletcher Ave, Fort Lee, New Jersey, 07024. And tomorrow, Tyler, uh, we'll give you some tips on how to pick a good broker. How to avoid some of the problems with these folks. You'll be look licking those envelopes. Right? <laughs> That's All right. right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gary. We'll and this week we've been looking at the problem of bad brokers, small minority of brokers and dealers that really don't trade squarely. And tonight in the final part of his special report, Business Editor's Garrett Glazer shows us what smart investors can do to protect themselves. And that is really the question everybody needs an answer to. You said it. And uh, Tyler, the explosion in, in U.S. trading volume has fattened the bottom line for the nation's securities firms. They earned more than $12 billion before taxes last year. It's a record. But that money has a downside, too. It is a temptation for an unscrupulous few. Here now from sources on both sides of the law are some tips for protecting yourself from the bad guys. It began with commodity options. Uh, we went into oil and gas leases. Uh, we sold penny stocks for a while. Um, we sold general partnerships on the Internet, uh, rare gold coins, uh, gold bullion. He calls himself Steve Michaels, would not tell us his real name. State investigators vouched for him. A scam artist who says he's gone straight after two criminal convictions and a brief prison term. He says he bilked investors for 25 years, total take more than $40 million. Never allow yourself to be talked into a decision involving your money while the salesperson is on the other phone line with you. I don't care if it's from a well-respected investment firm. I don't care if it's from a total stranger. Here are some more tips from the experts. Remember that stockbrokers are, first and foremost, salespeople. Remember to think about a broker's motivation for encouraging a particular trade. Ask, what's your compensation on this trade, not what's your commission? In some cases, brokers enjoy tremendous markups on the house stocks they push. House stocks are usually micro-cap stocks in which the firm makes a market or has a large inventory. A simple rule of thumb that I have is never, ever buy a security or never buy a stock from someone on the phone that you've never met. Try to select your broker after a face-to-face -face interview. Talk to several brokers first, preferably at their office. What kind of feeling do you get about the broker and the office? What does your gut tell you? Ask about the broker's professional training and background. Request a copy of the disciplinary record, known as a CRD. Check with authorities in your state, too, to be sure your broker is licensed to do business there. Ask if the firm is a member of the SIPC. SIPC does not insure against wrongdoing to investors. It can provide partial reimbursement if and only if a brokerage goes out of business. One California regulator says L.A.'s San Fernando Valley is the new ground zero for telemarketing fraud, sort of boiler room central. 35 out of 100 suspected boiler rooms opening here in California over the last year are right down there. We're from CNBC. By the time we got to Venture Tech 2000 in Encino, California, authorities had already paid a visit, served a search warrant, and confiscated computers. Still, there was sales literature on a table, and it was clear the company was still in business. State investigators say they believe the company lied to investors and sold unregistered securities in a year-long telemarketing scam. There's some very definite inaccuracies. This man's an executive vice president of the company. He told us investigators overreacted, that the company is legitimate, but he declined to answer any other questions. 
give me the next 60 days. If I, if I can't perform for you, close out your account. This is part of a secretly recorded phone call to a boiler room currently under investigation by the New York State Attorney General. And in California, this was the scene at one of eight telemarketing boiler rooms the FBI busted in one day. The operators of this one allegedly raked in $30 million in one year. Would you be prepared if boiler room scam artists called you? Here are the warning signs. High pressure sales tactics for one. If they have to have a decision right away, look out. Look out too for outrageous promises of high profit at low risk. Does the firm seem reluctant to give you lots of information? There's probably a reason. Is there mumbo jumbo about so-called inside information or secret technology? Avoid investments you don't understand. One of the traps that people get into is they think if they don't understand an investment, it's because they're stupid. Oftentimes, they don't understand the investment because the investment doesn't make any sense. If they don't understand it, they don't need to be in it. If you've already invested, watch your account closely. Make sure your statements and confirmations arrive quickly. Read them carefully. If there are discrepancies, complain in writing right away. Don't wait. The problem is that unless you read the statements and immediately complain about an unauthorized trade and complain in writing about an unauthorized trade, then you will have been deemed to have ratified the trade. Remember, if you feel hounded by high-pressure sales tactics, hang up the phone. Be wary of ads which give little more than a toll-free phone number. Never make an immediate decision on a purchase. Always get written information about the firm and the salesperson first, then about the investment. Don't part with your money until you've talked to someone you trust, maybe your accountant or personal attorney. Hi, good morning, George. How are you? All right, how are you doing? Listen to this audio recording made by an undercover investigator posing as an interested customer, a Dr. Andrews. He's calling a licensed broker at a suspect firm and canceling a $4,300 stock order he'd placed the night before. I had a long conversation with my lawyer, my insurance payment is tied up, I can't move forward at this stage. I won't be liquid in the next uh, two weeks like I thought. Come on, it's a piss hole in the snow, you'll probably spend more than that on a cheap date. No, it's, I have to uh, cancel the trade, I'll make it uh, as soon as I'm liquid again. So what are you telling me? So I want to cancel the trade. You want to cash out your trade with me? Yeah. I have to cash out. No, I'd hate to see you do this, because you're going to be walking away from a... Cancel the trade. Just cancel it, George. Over the next six minutes, the client directs the broker no fewer than 27 times to cancel the order. Finally, the broker alludes to a relative whom he says is a member of a violent New York gang. Let me ask you a question, Dr. Andrews. Please. Do you know who my uncle is? The older. Okay. He's with the Westies. Do you know who they are? Well, that gang, please tell me, broke up in the mid-80s. No matter, you get the idea. Some will stop at nothing to intimidate. Although we found no simple answers over the last three months, we did find several areas that proponents say could make a difference. First, more criminal prosecutions. Second, moving broker-customer arbitrations to a forum outside the industry. And third, expanding the occasional denial of IPOs when those offerings are underwritten by broker-dealers with excessive disciplinary histories.